Hello everyone, this is a new IITT lecture series, Interactive, International Interactive Technical Talk. I believe it's the 11th one. This time it's about observational method in geotechnical engineering, TC206. We have with us renowned lecturers, speakers. I'm gonna share my screen to introduce you quickly to our speakers. So with us today, we have Duncan Nicholson, Tony O'Brien, Ying Chen, and Nanyang Yo Michael. Duncan is the chair of TC206. He's the author of Sierra R196 on the observational method. Very well uh, known and renowned uh, uh, expert in the observational method. Also with us, Tony O'Brien, um, leader with uh, Matt McDonald, fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. He is also with TC206, observational method, and TC212, my favorite deep foundations. Uh, I'm skipping their expertise because you will see they're very well, uh, you know, knowledgeable in this field. Also with us, Ying Chen, Chartered Engineer Associate in uh, TYPSA UK and Ireland, 16 years of experience in the underground uh, and excavation structures, also with TC206. With us also, uh, Anyang Yo Michael, managing partner at RM Engineering Limited from Ghana. So we are covering the spectrum between academia and industry from all around the world. Welcome to our session. I like to give the floor in order to uh, Duncan, then Tony, then Ying, and then Michael without specific uh, reasons, but uh, because Duncan is going to start with the introduction and some history. Could you go ahead, please, Duncan? Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Is that coming through okay? Yep. yep. Go ahead, okay. yes. If you could you. all mute, <clears throat> have a clear Unless you want to interact, then you can unmute. We'll have a clearer. Well, well, thank you very much, Mark, for inviting TCA 206 members to give this IITT. Um, it's an opportunity to uh, discuss the observation method on a wider base and hopefully pass on some of the features to our, our listeners. Moving to the next slide. So the introduction to TC206 uh, observational method, um, I'm giving this initial overduction. And basically there are three parts. There's an overview of the observation method and a bit of history. There's an introduction to TC206 and what it covers, and also a summary of the recent activities and, and the areas where we see the need to develop further. So, so historically, um, Peck introduced the observational method in his ranking lecture in 1969. And I think that really summarized his experience with, uh, with, with Tetsagi and so on a previous to, uh, over the previous 20, 30 years. And he identified that the observation method is used where there's large uncertainties in the ground or construction methods. He identified two approaches, basically the ab, ab initio approach, which is where the design is developed with the options of change uh, prior to the start of work. And in his terms, he, he, he started with most probable parameters, which enabled him to do a cost-effective design but he had uh, a monitoring plan with contingencies to take on board the worst credible parameters encountered in, in, in construction. And that enables a maximizing of savings. 
He also identified the best way out. And this is where the observation method is introduced during construction for unforeseen uh, events and where we're using the monitoring data to feed into back analysis and vary in the design. So here's, in ab initio terms, he identified the Harris Bank and the use of struts in a deep excavation. He, he looked at the bay transit tunnels and he, he looked at volume loss control. He, he looked at best way out in terms of soft clays on, uh, with stockpiles and how to optimize construction and in Cape Kennedy Causeway on hydraulic fills. So he identified a range of different types of uh, observation method, not just basements, but a range. He also identified pitfalls, which is where the geology could be worse, and that's buried channels often associated with the uh, best way out options, monitoring, and if there's a risk of progressive failure or brittleness, then that could happen too fast and you can't put in place contingency plans. Uh, reporting and interpretation is important because we need timely and robust change to make sure we can do that uh, quickly. And Ying will talk a bit more about that in due course. And the design must be varied during construction. And, and that leads to varying construction, leads to contractual issues, client involvement. And Tony will talk about some of the difficulties with that. An OM, in principle, can be used in anything with sensors and uncertainty, not just in excavations. It can be done in piles, ground treatment, grounding, and dewatering. <clears throat> so briefly, a quick summary here of what are the key changes. And the key ones I've highlighted, in my opinion, they're highlighted in red. So PEX ranking lecture is the starting place. The draft Euro codes was a formative codes, the first time that OM clauses and OM had got into the uh, uh, codes of practice. The Syria guide was a composite of, uh, of experience in, in Europe, mainly at that stage. And it followed on from uh, the Heathrow collapse and so on and various other jobs. Uh, there was a lot of jobs in the 19, early 1990s, which... Uh, help formulate experience. And then TC760 uh, on embedded walls, that takes the uh, OM approach one stage further and looks at a more holistic approach to uh, embedded walls. And I'll deal with that later. And uh, we've now renamed TC206 as the observational method. And our next challenge will, will be the next Euro code EC7 with uh, revisions, and we're thinking about writing some guidance to go in parallel with it. So <clears throat> background to the observational method, I mentioned PEC's ranking lecture, most probable and worst credible are the starting points. Eurocode was the first code to recognize OM, design changes during construction, but there's very little really written on it. The serial guide, used uh, characteristic parameters as, as a basis because uh, design is changing between PEX date and uh, after the 30 years up to the Syria guide. So we're having to change the, the setting for the observational method. And in uh, 760, that we've got this holistic approach uh, and we find that most jobs start with characteristic parameters now and then evolve as change goes on. So one of the things that came out of seven, uh, the, uh, the serial guide 185 was a definition of the observation method. Um, and that is that the observation method in ground engineering is a cautious, managed, interacted, integrated process of design, construction, control, monitoring, and revision that enables previously defined modifications to incorporate it during or after construction as appropriate. Now, the key issue here is that the observation method is, is, a, is a process, and it's, it's how you enact that process going from design through construction, control, monitoring, and review and change. The goal is to achieve greater overall economy without compromising safety, and the method can be adopted for an inception of the project or later as benefits. Uh, or identity. Duncan. Yeah. Duncan, how do you compare this to the term value engineering on a construction site? Is it similar in some ways? 
So, so value engineering, and, and uh, Tony will deal with this under contractual frameworks. Value engineering is a construction, is a stage in the uh, evolution of des the design going into the contracting, and it's it's it provides a a contractual clause which enables change during construction. Change during construction is key to be able to uh, the observation method because you have to be able to uh, change either things get worse or you take advantage of things getting better and so a value engineering right. clause enables you to do that change hmm. but well, it's a contractual maybe... uh, yeah, yeah go ahead tony so, so, so yeah may, maybe i'd suggest that um Shall we... our observational method could be considered to be a, a subset of value engineering in general because value engineering could include any sort of uh, alternative design or construction option which might add value um, and OM is part of that. Do you want to say yeah. a few more about that later under the contractual framework, Tony? Yeah, yeah, could do, I, yeah. Because yeah, I think so it, I kind it, it fits into your, um, yeah. your uh, presentation uh, yeah. at this stage. Um, if, yes. If, I won't say too much more about it. It is dealt with in Serial 185 under the section under contractual framework and so on. One more thing, uh, Duncan, for the viewers. If uh, Syria is, where is it based? Syria is based in London. Syria, okay. Syria is the construction industry research uh, framework. And it's, it's, yeah. it's, ba it's basically a group of... Um, parties and it, it's, it's industry part partners and they can be contractors designers they can be clients uh, other organizations uh, who put funds into a project so there are various projects going through and from from that pot of money then they let a contract to write different guidance you're right sorry to interrupt it's called interactive so <laughs> keep no problem. going no problem <laughs> you uh, okay, so uh, I'll carry on. Uh, so by, I, I wanted to emphasize this issue around process. And this, this is, this is, looks at where the OM, uh, the observational method features in the process. So the overall process starts high level national and corporate policies. And that's where Eurocode interactions comes in under corporate and project organization that's contracts. And that's where the value engineering clauses have to be uh, incorporated into a project's contract framework. Often, if there are fixed contracts, you won't have value engineering clauses. Then there's a value engineering value management loop, and that interacts with the design and planning stage. Uh, at the design stage, it's often also better to have contractor involvement to get flexibility and this is where you get the contingency plans and trigger values from you then start your construction control you've got a monitoring framework you have a re review process on site very important to review the data coming through and then you look at the triggers are they being exceeded no in which case you can carry on to the next stage of excavation. If they are exceeded, then you're looking to implement your, either your modification plans or your contingency plans. Um, so that's the that's by by the process that sort of uh, explains where the different stages in in OM uh, matter. I put this up just to um, explain uh, the. Design the, the 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 typical uncertainty we get in design terms. This is a simplistic idea of a a, re, a cantilever retaining wall and, and de measured deflections. Now we might make a prediction of prediction of, of flex, deflections using our current uh, parameters, and we might find that we predict a number off here using our understanding of characteristic parameters. When we start measuring field med data we might find a, hist a histogram of uh, movements and we might find an average and we might find if like five percent exceedance and a characteristic value and this enables this data as we gather more and more data and understanding enables us to understand green where we're in the conservative side of things and uh, 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 and safe amber when change is occurring 
and generally speaking red is where we don't want to get to exceeding that or we want to pull the design back under control before we reach the final stage of excavation. This gives the application of these triggers and construction in a multi-stage excavation and it shows here the uh, construction starts in a multi-stage excavation and you might be measuring lateral deflections on in inconometers and as the work progresses, well, as the work is designed, you might have predicted a most probable assessment of movements and a characteristic assessment of movements. And once you start on site, you, you then might see the movements less than you expected. And then you take a, the advantage of either miss, of missing out struts or um, missing out the final stage or modifying any excavation stages. If the movements start to be too great, then you need to enact your contingency plan before you get to the final stage and before you uh, exceed the SLS, which controls, often that's the prediction that then controls the limiting bending moments in the excavation, uh, in, the, in the retaining wall design. Um, and I've put in here green, amber and red, which identify green, amber and red at these conditions here. So in simple terms, that's that's the application of OM to deep excavations. The Syria guide looked at this in more detail and it identified that the majority of excavations that we're doing weren't designed with OM at the start. They started off with characteristic designs. They looked at ex the movements as they occurred and then they evolved the redesign during the course of the work. Now that is that is hard because you have to be able to vary or take on board the back analysis of the excavation rapidly you have to get consensus and then you have to, but with the client and with the checkers in order to then implement the you know, the changes that you can justify from your back analysis uh Observation method is controlled with, uh, used with ground uncertainty. I've just listed here geological uncertainty, parameter uncertainty, ground treatment uncertainty, and construction complexity. And, uh, and often the types of application we've got for OM fall into these general headings. I've moved now to the, uh, so I've introduced now the observation method principles. Uh, and I just wanted to say a few words about TC206. TC206 is uh, about 35 members. We've got a mailing list of 60 people. Uh, and we actually have got quite a few people that that sort of uh, are just joining us just to see whether or not they're interested in, in, in learning more. And we'd encourage more people to do that and then become uh, then become corresponding members. We have a general committee that meets monthly, which reviews what the activities we've got. And we've got we've got a technical committee which meets three monthly in which we identify we're making progress. We've got five working groups as well, which are where we see the main issues to occur. Now, the key issue with the observation method 206 is that we interact with structural engineers, contracts and clients because they're the people that that uh, we can uh, we need to influence in terms of getting the steer and the overall perception of that and that's where Tony will be uh, looking. We we look at iron iron instrumentation and monitoring TC two twenty because instrumentation is key to to uh, being able to back analyze something. We link up with tunnels or with other because if there's a history of. Uh, observation method in NATM and rock tunnels and so on. And we're keen to uh, look at other people's applications of OM. We link up to o numerical 103 because we're interested in um, understanding the back analysis and, uh, and, and getting the most out of that. And, and Ying will talk more about how, how uh, we're looking to speed up the process of back analysis. And we also deal with machine learning because, again, we want to do this back analysis as fast as possible and ideally in parallel with the excavation process. So our working groups within TC206 are uh, the contractual group, which Tony leads, the field monitoring group and database, which is uh, Daniele, 
the real-time back analysis, which is Franz and Ying. The codes and guides is, is Johan Spock. And the tunneling group is Chris Menkiti. And, and so we, we've we pulled these together, these groups together in order to uh, keep on generating um, learning and experience. So Tony looks after the uh, contracts work group and the value group. And so I won't say much about that because he's uh, he, he'll be explaining that in due course. Uh, INM links with uh, TC220. And we have a good dialogue with TC220. They're interested in improving training. They're interested in specifications and selection instruments. They're interested in monitoring plan and IM coordinator role. And they also cover databases. Databases and the control of data and the gathering together data is very important. And Work is done by the Association of Geotechnical Specialists, AGS. These are the guys that set up the framework for borehole database gathering. Uh, but they've also got into the guide of planning a, a program of geotechnical instrumentation and monitoring. And, and basically, what is the data that's being collected? What is the, how is this being managed and stored and prepared and put in a common base and that's the data the data management section and then how is it distributed to the people that use it and so data sent to engineers for use in evaluation is a key interaction we want access to the construction of the work on site and it's uh, the, the field work we want access to the instrument the inclometers and so on the psometers the range of those in order to understand the process that's developing back analyze it and, and also interact with it. And to some extent, things are changing in electronic databases in terms of the magnitude uh, of the database. And, and it's almost becoming a separate uh, contracting framework to that's evolving to handle these big data operations. I won't say any more about this, but the, the <laughs> the, the next stage will be to get the client's involvement to setting up INM systems, the designer's role to specify these spe these data handling systems. We've got the main contractor and he's going to coordinate this, this role. And then the, the, there'll be a, a position for the data man management contractor in due course, who's, who's pulling this data together fast. So, Ying will talk in detail about the real-time back analysis, and that fits down here where we've got monitoring data coming through on a weekly basis. We Ideally, we want to be back analyzed this as the excavation goes, so we're up to date with it, and we're looking for opportunities or, and, and disadvantages of things going right or wrong. We're updating predictions, and that then feeds into the review process, and then we can see what the options are for changes to the design. So another feature is that we're trying to look at updating codes and OM guidance. The next Euro code is going to be published 2024, and we're looking to review that and to see whether we can produce more robust guidance. Singapore MRTC have produced their own specifications for OM and they use on their projects. We're tracking the contractual use of, uh, of uh, specifications. So another part of what uh, uh, is interesting from the discussions that we've been having with Michael is, is that uh, how does OM apply in developing countries? And I think he's going to look at, he's on the TC206, but he looks at it from a, uh, from a different perception. If you like, Ghana is a developing country, and so the, there is a limited opportunity to apply OM. And it's trying to find this boundary of how you introduce instrumentation uh, and uh, control in, in, in systems where, if like, there isn't much experience of that in, in the past. And so I think that will be interesting in our discussions around that. So in summary, overview, uh, we've overviewed the observational method. Got, you understand the framework. We've introduced TC206 and how we set ourselves up, and we've summarized some key groups. And 
I'll, uh, that's as far as I wanted to go. So, yeah. uh, Mark, I don't know if there's any questions you want to raise at this stage. So, so I, I had a question as well, <laughs> an observation. <laughs> an observation. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Tony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think one of the interesting things you, you, that comes across in, in what you were just saying, though, is um, the breadth of what observational method involves. You know, involves you know many aspects of geotechnics. Also involves appreciation of um, structural behaviour as well, often, um, and, and how projects are organised and delivered. So, so that breadth of expertise which is needed to the deliver observation method can in itself be actually a bit of a challenge because your um, advocate or practitioner has to be both quite broad uh, as well as quite specialist in certain areas so um, now in, in terms I... of widening the uh, use of OM that yes. in itself is an issue actually and I think if you think back to where Peck and Tizagi came from, they were experienced engineers and they had the ear of the clients because things were going wrong or they're changing things. And so they're in a strong position to influence the design and they've got the ear of the client to uh, justify that change. Hmm. And so it's easier I can see it was easier in Peck's times or when he, yeah. in his position to, yeah. to to get these systems to work. So, so, so perhaps one of the modern the modern problems, which perhaps didn't exist <laughs> 30, 40 years ago, is a you know, modern challenge is perhaps um, perhaps we've got too much specialization sometimes mm. in some of our technical disciplines. Mm. And, and that's now um, becoming quite difficult in terms of the breadth that's needed from an individual who's going to lead an OM application on a project because you do have to be broad to lead it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, so, so maybe there's an educational issue there uh, and something around how we um, organise projects as well. So it goes into project management and mm. you have to get your geotechnical engineers to be good at project management and interfacing well, with the well, contractor well, and client. Well, at least now how to communicate to them. Yeah, It's a communication issue. And, uh, uh, and... Uh, yeah, nowadays with uh, many lawyers hovering over projects and uh, uh, the new technologies, um, it's suffocating a little bit the innovation with the OM mm -hmm. uh, because OM to me was key for innovation in the past and advancements mm -hmm. uh, as a practitioner president of ISS MGE. I cannot tell you how happy I am with this session. It's all my life I was a design build uh, person and uh, the observational method is in the center of that mm. uh, to create innovative solutions that work. So I'm very, very happy. Let's proceed with you, Tony. Okay. I think. Yep. Uh, okay. Duncan, do you still I'll have... Stop, I'll stop sharing. Let's stop... see if yeah. I can... All right. uh make the uh, system work um it's working is, is is that sharing yes yes i don't know it. if it's your first slide okay i'll try and uh, uh it seems to have frozen um so can you see it's my can you see my screen uh, we can see your screen uh, is it showing a table observational message yeah. plus yeah, context. No, yeah yeah ah, that's great it's frozen <laughs> um hang on i'll try and reshare Are you sharing the PowerPoint? Make sure you're sharing the PowerPoint, not another file. Okay. Um, 
Aha. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think we're in business now. Okay. <laughs> well done. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Zoom. Yeah. So I suppose um, I, I like to use the term uh, observational control when I'm uh, talking to clients and contractors because control is, is a key word in my mind for, for using the observational method. So Duncan's obviously gone through what what, what OM is, um, but perhaps I'd just like to highlight perhaps the essential requirements, which is to um, reliably obtain the critical observations and, and able to implement timely pre-planned contingencies, um, the avoidance of progressive collapse. Um, but a really key thing, which is not really a technical issue, but is often the biggest challenge is to get stakeholder support. So, you know, many people um, involved in the project have to be, um, <clears throat> you know, on board and supportive of using the uh, observational method. So it can't be just a designer, it has to be the contractor, yeah. client. And increasingly these days, uh, checkers need to be comfortable as well. Now in the and bottom- the client. Yeah, the client particularly. So the bottom right of this slide is just a, a tiny selection of um, projects where the observational method has been uh, successfully used in different parts of the world. So these are big projects and there's big time savings, um, you know, several months typically. So that generates huge value, huge cost savings, time savings, um, re reduces disruption to local communities. So you might ask yourself, why, if the OM can generate such fantastic benefits, why don't we use it on every project? The key, two key issues, which are closely related. One is conventional contracts um, prevent the use of the observational method. It's not in anybody's commercial interest to use the observational method. Um, also, and maybe something which is far more subtle um, is industry culture. Because perhaps people in industry get used to working in their own little silo. So the designer does his design, contractor builds something, the client sits back and, and waits for something to be delivered. I think an important feature of the observational method is everybody has got to shift their position a little bit and um, collaborate together. So, so all those little silos have to move and overlap. So people are truly working together. And that's an uncomfortable position um, for many organizations these days. Um, a, a recent challenge on, on big projects in particular is design assurance, checker approvals, because um, if you don't get a checker uh, on board, to sign off on project, then then things won't happen and the OM won't get used. So I think you know, when I reflect on what's happened over the last few decades, I see a lot of real technical changes, you know, which have been real value in terms of observational method. But something that hasn't changed and maybe has even got worse is industry culture, which is stopping us use the observational method. Um, in, in, in order to provide some practical examples of how we've done the observational method on real projects, um, I've got the um, book that myself and a colleague, Alan Powderham, have published, and that gives a wide range of different um, OM applications and, and some of the real issues that had to be overcome to, to, to use it in, in reality. So looking at contracts, which, which can be a key blocker, um, I won't go into detail on this, but um, just look at the uh, the traffic lights because traffic lights are important for the OM. Traditional contracts, there's very little opportunity really, usually, because the design and a contractor are separated. Whereas for OM, the designer and contractor have to work very, very closely together. Conventional design and build, well, there are opportunities, but intense time pressure, particularly during 10 can, can um, reduce the chance to use OM uh, and particularly to build trust between the parties. And obviously there may be concerns around uh, approvals either by the client or by 
checkers, which may prevent the use of them. Um, so more modern contracts, this is green area here, so these types of contracts, which are really starting to be used in the last few years. So early contract involvement, progressive design build. The key change here is there's usually a lot more time for the parties to work together to gain trust and to explore opportunities, which is really what the OM is also about. It's not just about controlling downside risks. It's also about creating opportunity to do something better. And that's really what um, the OM is, is about and what we need to focus on in the future for the industry, I think. So as Duncan mentioned, TC206, we're trying to provide new guidance um, mainly aimed maybe at clients and procurement specialists, so not necessarily just geotechnical engineers. But I think it's important that geotechnical engineers understand what needs to be in a contract to facilitate the observation method. Because one of the key things here is encouraging wider use. Because frankly, at the moment, hardly anybody does the OM. Um, and we need to change that dynamic so, so more people think about using it. So alignment of commercial interests is, is a key issue here. And to get that alignment, there's got to be incentivization in the contract. If you don't have some incentivization, a contractor simply may not be interested because you won't get some benefit in terms of a cost or material saving from self. So a key clause is what's often termed a value engineering clause. And certainly when I've seen OM being used, the introduction of that clause or having that clause in a contract has been a, a game changer. Um, it can be used in any type of contract, but um, there are some particular contracts which have been recently introduced. I'll highlight here the new engineering contract. Um, the new version of that, version four, has a value engineering clause embedded as a core clause. So we can call on that. Also, the new version of FIDIC also has a core clause, which is a value engineering clause. So that's really important because people <coughs> need to... Tony, yeah? sorry to interrupt you, but uh, from my experience, when uh, we pushed with the client for value engineering, um, I'm putting it in simple terms. We say when with collaboration with all parties, we can save the contractor will get part of the profit of the saving. So that is not upset that we're reducing his contract. Mm. So we mm. tell him, hey, we're reducing your contract, but you're not losing the profit on that part we reduced and this is key to pushing everybody to implement uh, observational method i don't know if yeah yeah that that that's I am key. summarizing a little bit in uh, mm. practical terms what you're yeah. showing right yeah yeah no that's uh, absolutely a key part of it um and and the client needs to understand that they will get benefit as well um because often that the key benefit for a client would be a saving in time and also a saving, is a big a saving thing, yes. um, and that will often save uh, disruption to local communities, um, particularly for urban projects, which is really important. Time and money, because he's not paying yeah. for the extra work, he's just paying the yeah. profit part of that <laughs> exactly. extra work. Exactly. So so having that in, embedded in the contract is, is vital. Um, but even when you have the a good contract, so if the contract's okay, there still needs to be somebody who's going to lead the OM and reassure stakeholders um, that using the OM is not going to be create any, for example, safety problems. Um, often when I talk about OM, well, first of all, people often don't understand it. So that's the first challenge is, is trying to explain what it is in simple terms. And then the next point is actually make, in my experience, OM implementation 
improves safety, enhances safety. You, know, you can create a far safer working environment when you do the OM. And that is uh, really important to, to get people on board. Um, so, so Say clear... why? Sorry? Why in your mind, in your opinion, that OM would enhance safety? Well, if you take, for example, the common use in multi-propped uh, deep excavations, um, trying to install a prop at depth, say at 30 meters depth, is a huge exercise. Um, it's difficult and in itself is, is quite dangerous you know, in terms of operatives working on the site. So if you don't need to install that extra support at depth, that's a major benefit. And you've got a far wider, larger working space to work in, um, which is safer again. You know, people could actually work quicker and easier if you've created more space in that environment to work in. So, so there's, you know, there's lots of examples like that. Um, but, you know, in terms of convincing people, which, which is often the most difficult aspect of any OM application in terms of achieving agreement is you really need to address these four, four issues here, convincing business case, you know, what are the real benefits in terms of cost time, a sound technical basis, um, risk management and, and trust, um, the, the... Ying, what is your opinion on that? Uh, yeah, well, because I heard this conversation, I just uh, want to say I really like uh, uh, Tony said uh, about this OM is about the control because uh, uh, I think when we may, every time when we introduce this to client or contractor, they, their their perception about risk is that, oh because we, we use uh, less propping, then that's more risk. However, because we introduced OM, we actually were really enforced on the monitoring and the control. So in other ways, it's actually safer rather than risky. So yes, that I yes. just want to add on. Yeah. 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 Hundred percent. Thank you. Yeah. I was gonna yeah. say that, but. You said it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. In in terms of, um, I think it's also important though to emphasise that OM isn't a panacea. So um, we can't always we always use it everywhere. everywhere. So, so, so you know these aspects <clears throat> have to be addressed, as Duncan mentioned earlier. Um, you know, time is a really important aspect. So the contractor has to be on board that you know they they can implement contingency measures within the necessary time periods. Um, we need to have in simplicity because communication is key when you're doing the work on site. So we get quick decision-making. So all parties understand roles and responsibilities. Um, and in terms of what Ying is talking about, you know, real-time monitoring um, re really supports implementation because we get deeper insights into behavior. But um, one aspect which certainly I found beneficial is um, a, a type of OM called progressive mod modification, which is around closely tracking trends and then introducing incremental changes from a conservative starting point. And often when you do it like that, you, you implement beneficial changes, um, which, then have, which people can then see the benefits and people get relaxed about using the OM, I mean, that builds you know, support. Um, instrumentation monitoring obviously is key to this. And the, the critical aspect here is quality, not, not quantity. So just to flag up um, one particular issue because of you know, the breadth of issues that can be involved um, is one early case history, um, just to talk about limits of what can be analyzed and predicted because we can't always predict everything in advance. Um, but nevertheless, risks can still be safely managed. Um, and obviously, ground is an important aspect, and as geotechnics practitioners, we'll, we'll always think about the ground. But it's not the whole issue. There's other uncertainties as well. Um, so they can't always be dealt with through manipulation of um, geotechnical parameters. So an early OM application in the UK was a mansion house. Um, this is one of the most... Um, important and prestigious buildings in London, um, you know, highly sensitive. Um, the building owner was extremely sensitive about it. 
um, had a very complex history, um, both um, above and below ground. Um, and an early stage of a, a new project at that time was the DLR extension <laughs> caused some movements, which created great anxiety and stopped the project. Um, so how to move forward. I won't go into a lot of detail because we don't have time, but the OM was successfully implemented um, after you know some really challenging discussions to get everybody on board. But one of the really key aspects of this project, and it's a common issue for many OM applications because we're often doing them in urban areas. And in an urban area, a critical issue is how is existing infrastructure, how is existing buildings, how are they going to behave? Now, as geotechnical engineers, we all have a view, but structural engineers will also have a view. And we've got to work together across disciplines to develop real solutions. Um, a key issue on this project Sometimes was, it's not easy. <laughs> no, it's very difficult. But, but this is around uncertainties as well, Mark, because the uncertainty here is around building stiffness. This is a very old masonry building. Um, but it turned out that it had intrinsically high stiffness, which very much changed the settlement trough. The settlement trough was a lot wider. <clears throat> um, and that was really critical in terms of the, the risk reduction in terms of, although there were large settlements on these buildings, the angular distortion was very tiny everything just tilted a little bit. So there's really very little damage. The actual settlements troughs actually interacted a little bit as well and created time dependent movements. Um, so that's a key point really, which um, as geotechnics practitioners, we've got to bear in mind that we've got to have structural engineering colleagues on board and working closely with them to do real uh, OM application. Tony, I, I think this is also where, if like the first time, the green, amber, red trigger value system was actually introduced yeah, into that, any job. That's is right, that, yeah. Is, is that a correct statement? Yeah, that's right. So that's that's the point here. So it's the first time the traffic light system oh, I see, was yeah. used. Um, and it was enabled by real-time instrumentation monitoring as well. <clears throat> so, so, so it had a few firsts. Um, and in this project, actually, there wasn't a lot of sophisticated analysis. These days, we often think about doing complex analysis, but this is an example where you don't always need to do it. Uh, sometimes quite simple analysis can, can enable you to do the observational method, but, but there was some uh, maybe sophisticated thinking uh, backed up by excellent INM, which meant that this was successful. But the key point here was the structural behavior as well. So we've got to have structural people on board on the OM team. So instrumentation monitoring obviously is, is key. And, and so, you know, when we talk about procurement, it's also procurement of instrumentation. Um, often the purpose of instrumentation is not very clear. And again, there's poor commercial alignment. So, you know, what's in it for the contractor? You know, what will the contractor benefit? in terms of instrumentation. So poor quality data often um, results. So, you know, why are we doing it? Who, who is responsible for quality? Who is under contract and when are we going to install it? Um, and a problem is instrumentation monitoring is often seen as a trade activity. Uh, and maybe a challenge here for geotechnics people is, um, you know, we need to take an interest in procurement and contracts and, you know, the fragmentation and roles. And again, it comes back to making sure the main contractor is motivated to do a good job. So why is all this important? Um, it's all about better project outcomes. And I think with some of the technology we'll hear about soon, there's a real potential for a step change in geotechnics, um, you know, in terms of supporting better design and better understanding of ground structure interaction. Um, clients these days are talking about in digital twins. Um, OM enables us to create intelligent digital twins. So, so again, that's um, you know a step forward for us. 
So I think that's um, pretty much uh, it for me. But just to uh, also make a point that OM supports us in delivering um, our sustainability goals that we need to achieve for um, society's wider benefit. I think that's it for me, Mark. Any questions? Lots of stuff there. I really liked your uh, slides. Even though it took so much time, I didn't interrupt. I was really enjoying <laughs> okay. it. It's so okay. important. I'm going to give the Sorry. floor to Ying. Okay. Unless yeah. uh, any of you has a question or want to say something. Go ahead, Ying. Okay. Uh... Here. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Good. Okay. So if, uh, yeah, we can continue uh, because both uh, uh, Danka and uh, Tony mentioned this real-time back analysis. I think it, that's also something I'm quite uh, uh, passionate to introduce uh, because I had a privilege to work with uh, work with uh, both gentlemen. Uh, so Duncan is uh, the was the project director of my first design project in London, and he also mentored me through my PhD. But recently, I had the opportunity to work with Tony. We testing some uh, innovative uh, real time back analysis tool for the UK high speed railway project. So all this experience is very exciting. Inspired me and. Uh, 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 I went to do my PhD, and now it's really built my face in this observational method. So today I will uh, mainly cover this uh, real-time back analysis. It's a, a working group under the TC two six. We have been work uh, working in uh, since the November twenty twenty, and. Uh, the aim of this uh, research group is actually uh, try to link the constitute model parameters <clears> and collect the case history to test the back analysis algorithm. And we also have another smaller team. They probably more technical focused on the machine learning algorithm. However, regarding the whole RTBA group, we currently have the 14 active members. It's all from the UK, Europe, and uh, Asia, but we're actively recruiting people from the uh, like uh, American and African region to join this uh, uh, group to discuss. And we have this uh, 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 monthly meeting to do the knowledge sharing and uh, uh, technical discussion and try to creating the collaboration opportunities between the academia and the industry. And uh, I think we shared a lot of uh, uh, quality uh, technical discussions and uh, that's probably why even everyone have a very busy schedule but they keep coming to join this meeting and as you can uh, see two months ago uh, in uh, four symposiums of machine learning and big data in geoscience uh, the RTBA group held a special session 10 back analysis using machine learning for the observational method in this uh, conference. And we received uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, papers and half of them is actually outside of this uh, uh, TC206 group. And uh, this presentation attracted lots of uh, interesting interests and uh, the discussion. But uh, as we, uh, we can observe in general, we have the overlap interests in data you know, any type of uh, instrumentation monitoring data and how to analyze the back analysis data. So we shared this common interest with other TC uh, group like TC309 uh, machine learning uh, group and TC103 is numerical analysis group and even TC304, uh, they are doing the risk assessment heavily based on the machine learning algorithm. So next, I will quickly brief the uh, difference between the uh, traditional back analysis, machine learning back analysis, and the matured machine learning back analysis tools, which has been reviewed under this RTBA group. Uh, to help this comparison, I will also use one of these excavation case history from my PhD just to try to demonstrate the difference between this different uh, back analysis uh, uh, method methodology. So uh, in 1980s, <laughs> oh, 
the geotechnics have to uh, have have adopted the numerical modeling in the design so that's enable the, the possibility to use a field measurement to try to back check the design parameters. And I believe that's the start of the definition of the back analysis or inverse uh, analysis. However, from the demonstrated flow on the screen, you can see this procedure is a very much time consuming procedure. And sometimes it probably takes some luck for people to get where they wanted it to because it's heavily based on the uh, the user's engineering knowledge and judgment. But now, thanks to the technology development, then uh, we have this uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm in place and they, uh, the computational power allows mathematical tools to run thousands of analysis within a short time period. And uh, by definition, we, we only use it because this is an acceptable time frame for a construction project. So we call it a real time back analysis because, you know, it's hardly we can really do real time, right? We're still talking about like 24 hours as a real time term in this uh, uh, back analysis. So for the real-time back analysis, it's essential to have the machine learning optimization algorithm in place because that can significantly improve the back analysis uh, efficiency and accuracy. And also we need this uh, real-time back analysis got the capacity to work with different uh, uh, geotechnical uh, numerical modeling. You know, uh, we have so many different software program dealing with 2D, 3D modeling. So this real-time back analysis needed to have a capacity to deal with them. And also we, we now uh, academia keep developing lots of advanced soil constituent models. So this uh, RTBA also needs to be able to deal with them. Then the third most important uh, element is timely available uh, instrumentation and monitoring data. Like Duncan and uh, Tony mentioned, it's not about a quantity, uh, quantity is about the quality. So if we can get the very uh, high quality data, we can rely on those data, then back analysis results will be very uh, promising. However, like I mentioned, because all these are mathematical solution, so interpretation of the back analysis is still need to be in place. Because of this reason, I refuse to call this is AI. I still call it just a machine learning. So uh, as an engineer, I think I will drop still a little bit of security for now, but I don't know for how long. Uh, so here hi, on this- Hi, hi Yang, I just oh, had a, yeah. a, a question there just to, so do, do you think, um, in, in a way, um, because this, as you very importantly said, interpretation and judgment is still very important in mm -hmm. using machine learning technology. Do, yeah. do you think there's some da dangers that perhaps people might get hold of these tools and, and maybe misuse them, which then gives the technology a bad name? Yes, I, I definitely believe that because I have seen quite uh, often because uh, when people develop this uh, uh, machine learning algorithm, I know they are very passionate uh, and they try to sell their software. They were presented as like optimum value, but they didn't explain that's only mathematical solution. But as an engineer, we need to build enough uh, safety in our design. You know, mathematical, it doesn't matter. It could be plus minus. But from an engineer point of view, we cannot allow anything underestimated, right? Because that's just not on the safe side. However, I think those things need the user or engineer has to pick up those important facts and make a judgment before they adopt the results and applying their design. So that's why every time I just repeat, that's not AI, that's the machine learning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, here I just present like a three uh, machine learning uh, algorithm tools. I think under this RTBA, we have uh, got an opportunity to, to explore in a depth. So first one is a Bayesian uh, methodology based uh, uh, tool, they call the TILT. But I think it's still under development. It's not the uh, uh, not provided on the on the market yet. And the second one is called a Darwin. It's a genetic algorithm based uh, a data platform. So it's a commercially provided, and uh, I think it's. Uh, <laughs> 
if anyone interested, it actually can be used. And the third one is a statistic Bayesian uh, methodology based, uh, uh, more, uh, also a data platform. They call the meta model. But I believe that's probably more held internally by this contractor, Bauer. So it's, uh, I'm not quite sure it's uh, marketing commercially available, but uh, it's just under this RTBA. We had a chance to review it. But I want to show the uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, it's like a, in order to come uh, to show you the difference between the different uh, machine learning back analysis uh, tools, then I will use this uh, case from my PhD uh, research. So it's uh, the Elite Subsline uh, Totem Quad Road Station. It's a uh, oh sorry, it's uh, located at the central of London. So the excavation is in the typical over consolidated linden clay and uh, the excavation has adopted a bottom up construction uh, uh, methodology and from this photo you can see the original design have uh, designed like a one more level to support this bottom up excavation but uh, during the construction then the contractor and the design team work together to run some back analysis and develop their uh, observational method modification design. So they managed to uh, save the one level of uh, temporary prop and that has helped them to achieve the, like a two weeks construction time. However, uh, like I mentioned before, even time-wise, it's only two weeks, but because it's at a central London urban area, any time saving can uh, lead to a huge cost of saving. In this case, it's uh, roughly about 17% of a construction uh, cost. So uh, it's kind of a, quite a significant. However, in terms of a back analysis, at least a table just gave you a little bit of feeling or test. Uh, during the construction, this back analysis uh, and observational method modification development <coughs> is only giving four weeks. So at the end, I think the design team only managed to use some uh, pseudo final element model to run about 20 of the analysis. And based on that, they derive a set of the improved design parameter to develop their uh, modi modified OM design. However, uh, when we use this uh, new machine learning algorithm tools to test the back analysis there, as you can see, for this Bayesian method suit, they can run about a thousand analysis within 24 hours and they use a proper final <clears throat> element uh, software. And for this genetic algorithm, Darwin, then the, the Back analysis time is running between eight hours to 24 hours. However, you can see the number of analysis they can do is, uh, is almost <laughs> 3,000, 8,000 or more because uh, I think they, they got this function, you be able to run like a uh, back analysis in one excavation stage or multiple excavation stage. And also they can use a simple soil constitute model like a more column, or they can use advanced soil uh, constitute model like a hardening soil model with small string stiffness. So because of that, we can see currently with this machine learning algorithm, we definitely can almost do this real time back analysis. And and uh, this uh, uh, Darwin is uh, the one uh, I worked with uh, Tony. We did the trial for the HS2 project and uh, is already proved by by clients. So the client is happily for people to use this uh, uh, tool to run the real-time back analysis and propose the observational method for the project. So here just- Can, can I make a comment on that, Ying? And then yeah. Whilst you're just on Tottenham Court Road. Yeah. I, I see this in the future as a balance between mm -hmm. manual uh, back analysis uh, and the, the 20 examples. Mm -hmm. um, and it is difficult to come up with a consistent set of parameters in a very short period of time uh, mm -hmm. it, that, that you're confident in. But if in parallel you're doing the if like the machine learning options, then you're tackling the problem from two directions. And it, mm -hmm. it just gives you you just can't cover enough mm -hmm. options within a manual system to see whether you've picked the right yeah. variables. Yeah. So I just wanted to, uh, yeah. I see, I see it as a, uh, as a confidence gainer because you, you, you've got mm. your own engineer experience, but you're mm. also then building the, um, yeah. the machine learning experience. 
Yeah, basically, I think it's just a new tool, just to improve the efficiency, pro provide more information for engineer to make a yeah. better judgment. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think if you can, if we can run it, um, mm. uh, if it could run itself or min with minimum input, we should be able to offer a fairly cheap service to uh, to the contractor and client to, to flag up these options in the future. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'll, I'll leave you to yeah. yes. Carry on. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, so uh, I think I would just use a few simple graph to show you what's the fantastic uh, uh, function this uh, machine learning real time back analysis tool can provide. So on the screen is showing this Bayesian method, uh, single stage back analysis. So first of all, they are showing the sensitivity analysis outcome. They basically tell you in all the variables we treated, which one actually can make the uh, significant contribution in this back analysis. But in the meantime, they also gave the prediction graph that will filter down the uh, influence into three uh, major uh, major range. So first influence is a parameter variable uh, influence that's in the red zone. But then more important is the observational uh, influence like instrumentation and monitoring data, mm -hmm. because traditionally we thought uh, data is data not many people focus on this instrumentation data but in the reality when you applied you will find the uh, monitoring data arrow could be much more influenced than the parameter range they almost can dominate at a certain place but the last is about the which numerical model and which software you are using that also could uh, introduce lots of uh, influence or uh, misleading the engineer engineer's judgment. So this is just a, a one of the example. And then the other outcome is like, uh, it's showing the uh, patient and uh, back analysis uh, results from different uh, single stage back analysis. As we can see, even our uh, initial parameter range is exactly the same at every stage. But because we know this ground stiffness is nonlinear developed with excavation uh, uh, going deeper, more a uh, strain developed, the ground stiffness start to change. You can see the back calculated optimum uh, stiffness uh, value is also changed from stage to stage. So that will really uh, validate our engineering uh, knowledge and experience uh, to make sure. Do we believe this uh, back analysis results? Right. Uh, and uh, for the Darwin, then I would like to show this uh, really uh, is more like a visualization digital twin function from the Darwin. So when I run the single stage back analysis on the Darwin, they also can quickly give you the forward backward prediction at the previous excavation stage, how it behavior, and the forward prediction in the future excavation stage, how it will look like. However, it looks like uh, with this uh, more coulomb uh, soil constitute model, we probably will never get to the ideal situations. Like if we back calculate one of the excavation stage, we can accurately predict the future excavation behavior because uh, fundamentally it's just a more coulomb it cannot really reflect this nonlinear ground stiffness behavior. And then we also tried this uh, uh, different uh, advanced soil constitutive model, and we also target at the multiple excavation stage. By this way, you can definitely see the prediction at the, the, each excavation stage have significantly improved. However, there are still some uh, drawbacks. Even the advanced soil model seems cannot really give us a really uh, foreseeing prediction very accurately. So I believe there are still more works for this RTBA group continue to push in order to improve improve this, uh, this improvement for the future. So I, I I think there are lots of things I want to talk about, but I, I think I probably it's time for me to wrap up. So I would like to mention this machine learning algorithm application in the back analysis is definitely happening and it has improved the performance regarding the efficiency and accuracy. And it's actually enabled a real-time back analysis, which means we can introduce to the uh, contractor and the client to improve the construction. Uh, and I like to point it out, like there's a sensitivity study function in the real-time back analysis tool. It's actually really useful because they run the routine 
back analysis, they can help us to better understand the construction performance. It could be a very useful tool for the site construction support. And uh, then the the point is the interpretation of all this uh, instrumentation monitoring data and the back analysis outcome is essential because that will give you the physical and the geotechnical meaning. And with the RTBA, uh, I believe the observational method will be a rational solution for the digital construction time because that's a naturally a data-driven design approach. However, I think we're still facing the challenge like we need uh, uh, more data uh, case history, data pace to test all the available machine learning algorithm and then we can improve this RTBA function. Yeah, so I think that's uh, uh, from my part. Uh, hopefully you are enjoying this. <laughs> it's very enjoyable. But we have lack of time is yeah. crucial here. Yeah, uh, just for the viewers, mm -hmm. I like to mention that this is also very important in forensic geotechnics, which is my expertise, doing back analysis. And we have to talk after the session Ying, to help me in my future projects because I always do it by hand. Oh, so, yeah. and so what we're talking about is when you have instrumentations and monitoring and you get you're measuring the data you put it back in your finite element analysis mm -hmm. you compare if they don't match you modify your finite element analysis and this is called back analysis so they match so that you can predict the future this yeah. is how i understand it am i correct yeah 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 pretty much correct but it's just a uh, way you try to analysis. use it Use variable. the machine learning, trying to improve the uh, back analysis because they can run the, thousands, I, thousands of analysis, right? Yeah. I really, really like it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, are you ready? I'm ready, Mike. I'm ready. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's your turn, Michael. Could you stop sharing, Ying, so Michael can share his screen? Yep. Uh, stop sharing. <laughs> uh, we are running out of time, Michael. So we're counting yeah. on you to make. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I must say, um, I must say, I'm really enlightened with the presentation so far, and um, we've done. Can thanks a lot for the document you shared with me on text rank and lecture. Uh, in fact. I think all I've been said so far about it, I, I basically don't know what I'm going to add to what you've said so far. I think you said it all. Uh, but I think what I'm here for is to really present to you the, let's say the position of the minority in this case, some of us who are not exposed to the OM approach, some of us who have not gotten the exposure in relation to the OM approach. Yes, you've said it all and I think, uh, it needs to be done that way. So basically, like what you've said so far, uh, I think we've all understood the benefits and the requirements of the OM. But what we have here in our situation is uh, most often, um, we run more by the fiddic form of contracts, the red, the yellow, and the silver. And because most of our contracts, or let's say our projects are not so complex, it's quite easier to go by the red book, which obviously is designed by the client, and um, design is closed, Contract is awarded, contractor comes in. And most often when you have such situations, uh, OM is quite not practicable. And I think that is where we find ourselves. And for that reason, some of us are not exposed to the benefits and even the use of the OM. In fact, uh, when it came up, I was going to be part of this discussions, I had to reach out to a lot of fellow engineers to just check if I am the only one who has not been aware of some time now. And the truth is, I always have to explain to them what the OM was for them to say, oh, we know, we know, we know, we know. So, uh, like, I think I've discussed that with Duncan earlier. We do OM here in a subtle manner, just that our mind have not been drawn so much to it that what we are doing is at a certain level in OM. Uh, because most often, I mean, we have, although we do this red, silver, yellow book of contracts, we have the value engineering process in them. <laughs> 
So at a certain level, we do value engineering. But I think the issue here with some of us is, um, like when you read the PEX uh, rankings lecture, um, it talks about the part of where the quality assurance is being held and the part where you're using the measurement and know you've got it from the quality assurance to then go and do your back calculation to make sure your design is safe. I think what we do here, we are not intentional about the measurements, just that most often, of course, uh, I've been part of some projects in Nigeria, Burkina, and most of my experience in Ghana. And almost most of these projects, we do water level measurement during construction. Um, we do plate load tests when we excavate the foundation just to confirm the foundation parameters we give them and all. Uh, there are tests we do here and there, but then the issue is, is for quality assurance purposes. Uh, it's not necessarily really to go back and do back calculation and see whether we can save cost or time. So like you can see on my slide, I think what we do here is more of the factor, safety, the factor of safety approach, which uh, Pex made a remarkable statement in his lecture that is quite a wasteful approach, <laughs> which, which is what we do most in the case, because uh, you could see, because we are still doing uh, the conservative approach, pavement took CBR, factor of safety of three here and there, ground improvement. When there may be other means to the OM approach to have a cheaper and a better option. You look here and you can see clear in most of this red and yellow book. There's a clear line, there's a clear distinction between the supervising engineer and the design engineer. Most often you have the pre-contrast stage, you have the post-contrast stage. And the pre-contract engineer may not ever meet the post-contract engineer. So you do your due technical investigation, you write your report and all, you do the foundation design, you give it to clients, you have been paid, you go and start your construction. I mean, the next time you may get there, the building has been erected. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the OM approach is not really much here. But like um, I've been saying, the future of the OM, a place like Accra, Ghana is undergoing redevelopment in terms of infrastructural uplift, architecture, view and all. So it's already a built environment. So it's such a situation which I think in the near future, um, there are going to be deep foundation because it's already a built environment. We have small space to work within. I'm sure with this coming ahead, OM can be a better option for us to start with. Uh, so basically, I mean, like I said, it's more of the capacity building. Awareness. I mean, personally speaking, uh, I had to be part of this interaction to have a better idea and a better view of the OM. And in the absence of this, I may not have had the understanding I have now. So I think it's more of the awareness. Um, in fact, I'm taking it upon myself personally to, 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 to also go to my association of engineers trying to talk about the OM approach. You know? But frankly speaking, what we do is most of them is factor of safety approach, factor of safety or three, two point five, regardless of what is there, yeah. as when they start construction. Because like yeah. I said, you've done the pre-contract investigation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just, just may, maybe a few comments and, and questions, uh, Michael. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to get your perspective. Uh, I suppose what I'd say is, um, you know, there's many, many different applications in terms of OM applications um, that certainly I've seen and been involved in. Um, so, you know, you mentioned groundwater lowering. Um, I, I would say virtually every good groundwater control project that I've seen has had some, some element of observational method involved. Um, you know, the, the Tazagi, you know, uh, made some very important observations about, about um you know groundwater control and, and groundwater seepage um so so you know you'll never know ground permeability perfectly um so you know observational method is a classic way to do groundwater control properly so you know you might start off with a certain number of wells you observe how the water <coughs> table the water pressures have been reduced um, and then you've got the opportunity if it's not going well in certain parts of the site of introducing extra wells to to drop the uh, water pressures to the values you need them so you know that's that's a very clear application observational method which you know i would thought would be relevant globally to most projects um, 
and I'm sure it would be, um, you know, fairly clear to, to other parties why you would want to do that. Um, there's a simple saying as well, which is very useful, is that groundwater can seep for any theory. So um, you might want to use, use that as well. Um, but one thing I'm cautious about, though, is when you talk about factor of safety, observational method doesn't reduce factor of safety. Uh, you know, typically well, what you're doing, the observational method is you're, you're <coughs> controlling movements or observing movements and reacting to movements. So, and, and typically you're a long way from, you know, any instability, you know, so you, you never want to be in a situation where you're getting close to any large scale instability. So I think when you're explaining OM to people, you shouldn't be really talking about OM in the context of changing factors of safety. <clears throat> it's really about getting a better grip on, on uncertainties, whether that's ground uncertainty or structural uncertainty, and you know, using IM to control better what's happening. That, that's how I'd suggest you look at it. Reliability. Yeah, it's about reliability, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Michael, I'm counting on you to use this video <laughs> to <laughs> focus monitoring on all the projects in Africa because I work in Nigeria and mm. I'm you know, I'm facing this problem all the time. Yeah. Michael, yeah. we had, a, we had an interesting email exchange and I was out in India last week at a at a, at a, comp, a, DF, a an excavation conference out there and presenting the observational method uh, uh, and people if you like the level of sophistication just isn't paralleled they're doing metro yeah. systems they're doing high speed rail but they're if you like they're they're the, the INM maturity is just not there in terms of their uh in terms of their field applications if you like they haven't they haven't got this balance that i guess in in built up areas or places where um, instrumentation and control is, is in place. There are some areas developing very fast, like India, which, if you like, they're not geared up to monitor control and so on. So that was uh, quite an eye opener for, to, to me anyway. Um, <clears throat> so I think, I think yes, probably from TC206, one of the points are, is how do we how do we tackle this part of the uh, uh, of the market or the, the our colleagues our engineers to uh, uh, encourage this uh, th this level again, of um, assessment? To use this video. Duncan, <laughs> and again, Duncan, uh, I think one of the factors is um, you know with the slide you showed uh, there was um, I think that was Tony. Uh, you were saving some cost and timelines. Yeah. So I think that one of the issues we have here is the complexity of infrastructures. Mm. So then it's a scale of how much am I saving my cost in relation to even how much the foundation is in total. Yeah. So it depends on the complexity. Sometimes you have just not so much of a building and then you're going to spend on instrumentations yeah. and all. It rather becomes an extra cost, rather yes. instead of saving cost, yeah, because you may save nothing in, in relation to the project cost in total. So I think yes. that's why I said in a place like Accra, it's picking up in terms of infrastructural uplift. So I'm sure once we get there, obviously, I mean the exposure, the awareness, and all will come along. Mm. Uh, and this is this is this boundary between, shall we say, a house foundation pad footings and and routine foundation guidance. So you say I'm going to take a bearing pressure of 150 and it's 600 mil meters down. Routine guidance. Where where does a boundary become between that and a 10 meter deep basement? At some stage, site if you like the progression in uh, develop of infrastructure in different towns means that that that. Uh, this process takes over uh, or, or these other processes take over. And so that's a boundary we need to talk about. But it, but it comes down to um, still that basic issue of achieving agreement, doesn't it, uh, yeah. Duncan? That's a hard fought um, battle, yes. Yeah, yeah which, which is about, you know, really understanding the business case, you know, what are the yes. benefits? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
you know, how we're going to control risk, um, you know, building trust between parties um, bet, and technical competence as well. And those are all potentially quite down the list in developing countries. It takes a time for those to, to come up yep. at the same rate as their yep. infrastructure yep. development program. Yeah, yep. it's still a challenge in challenge. Uh, <laughs> in, in 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 countries in, that uh, are developed. You know, that, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So, Michael, is this your last slide? Yes, that was the last slide. Timing. <laughs> there was, thank I, you. I, also. Suppose, I suppose, suppose, Mark. Um, In fact, you said it all. There's nothing yeah, to add. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's That's beautiful. True. Thank you so much. I, I suppose, welcome, Mark, I had you. one um, one question for you. Um, it is, how is the international <laughs> society going to be able to help us um, build bridges with um, the, the other disciplines involved here, like our structural engineering colleagues and um, procurement specialists and like, because this is part of the key, isn't it, to um, promoting the observational method. Is there anything the International Society can do there? Is this question to me? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Now, now you now you have a video you can circulate and share <laughs> with uh, experts yeah. from all over the world. That's the key mm. of uh, that's the goal of this IITT session. Yeah, I, I really really like it. It was really interactive. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen now because yeah. uh, to connect with uh, the intro of uh, Duncan. Can you unshare, Michael? <laughs> is that a pack yeah, yes pack yes well, yeah, yeah. yeah that was uh, 30 years ago <laughs> wow yeah great isn't it nice to have dinner with peck yeah <laughs> i was lucky yeah, yeah. yes so this will uh, conclude this mm -hmm. IITT technical talk and I like I really like to thank you all. Um, it was really pleasant. It took more time than usual, but it was important. Uh, I think it's the most important uh, <laughs> IITT, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, that's great. It really hits me inside because this is exactly what I like to do in my professional life. Thank you so great. much, wherever you are. Okay. Thank uh, you. Have a good Bye. 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 Bye.